Welcome to, to the Elizabeth and Arwin Warren Folk Art Symposium, Object of Inquiry, New Perspective of, on American Folk Art. Thank you for being here and staying with us uh, for what promised to be uh, another amazing afternoon and end of afternoon. We will continue today's program with talks from Maria Gruner, Trevor Brent, and Yinchi Lermantan. And then here, uh, closing remarks from William D. Moore. As a quick reminder, closed captioning is available by activating the CC button at the bottom of your screen. And we will follow the same format as earlier. So just drop your question in the Q&A feature and we'll have a, a short Q&A after each session, each talk. Um, so we start off the second session with Maria Gruner and a focus on school schoolgirl samplers from the 19th century. Maria talk is titled Teaching a Feminine Terrain, Authority, Property, and Home in American Schoolgirl Needlework. Before I turn the virtual mic to Maria, hi Maria, um, let me introduce uh, her. So Dr. Maria Gruner is a scholar of gender and material culture. Her work probes the ways in which craft is gendered and gender is crafted. She received her doctorate from the American and New England Studies program at Boston University. Her dissertation has ever been the appropriate occupation of women, crafting femininity in American women's decorative needlework, 1820-1920, was awarding the Case N. Morgan dissertation prize. She is currently working on a book project on the themes of mending and repair in contemporary textile craft, grounding symbolic, political, and practical notions of repair in a long history of women textile activism. This work is supported by a research grant from the Center for Craft. She's also the recentering collection curatorial fellow at Historic New England. Please uh, join me in uh, giving a warm welcome to our guest, first guest of the second half. Thank you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and thank you to the other speakers. This has been really delightful uh, thus far and I look forward to the other presentations this afternoon. And thank you, of course, to the conveners of this symposium. Um, what a delight to spend to spend the Sunday afternoon with you all. Um, so I'm here to talk about one of my favorite genres of needlework, um, the building sampler, um, as we have depicted here. And to probe at what historical ideas they help illuminate. Just gonna let me go forward. Okay. So in the early 19th century, a nine-year-old girl from Newburyport, Massachusetts, stitched herself outside of the home. More precisely, she stitched herself the outside of a home or a building set on a stretch of land. She stitched an architecturally detailed, meticulously rendered piece of property. She was participating in a broader trend in schoolgirl needlework, the building sampler. Samplers were a form of needlework and needlework training expected of any young woman of sufficient means, and they were all about expectations for the future. So what did it mean for a young girl to stitch such a finely studied building before women could expect to own property? to stitch not just the home, but a house, especially in a medium so linked to ideas about domestic femininity. What do these stitched objects tell us about people's expectations about their stitchers' futures, about American girlhood writ large? Samplers were near, nearly synonymous with cultivated femininity and as such are important resources for those of us interested in historical ideas about gender. And in building samplers, I see burbling ideas about property, citizenship, the relationship between ownership and identity, and the nature of women's work and domestic expertise. But first, let's talk a little bit about how I read and understand schoolgirl sam samplers, a really wide ranging genre. Um, they're deeply important documents of a young girl's work. And they're remarkably important cultural artifacts. They communicate what teachers, families, and communities thought was important for a girl to learn, how they valued young women. They've been dismissed sometimes as unoriginal, derivative, decorative, or otherwise trivial. 
but these are objects that matter. And I want to make very clear that they also were objects that mattered to their makers, her teachers, and parents. Training and making them was expensive in the late 18th and early 19th centuries and communicated serious parental investment. By the early 19th century, a young girl's education and refinement, the pinnacle of which might be the completion of an ornamental piece of pictorial needlework, the silk on silk work, that could cost as much as sending a young man to Harvard or Yale, though the craft became more, much more accessible over the course of the 19th century. So why would parents make this kind of investment? What was so important about this genre of embroidery? What was the point of a sampler? Initially, a sampler was an intensely practical form. As its name suggests, a sampler was an example or rather a reference document. This was not a display object, but a collection of stitches and motifs to be tucked away and referred to at a later point. Uh, this is, these are examples of spot samplers. As the form evolved, it also became a place to practice numbers and letters, which might also be used to mark linens in the future. By the late 18th century, the sampler was no longer simply a source text that girls would anticipate consulting. It became both a pedagogical tool and a display object in and of itself, now featuring moral verses and iconography associated with moral femininity, often using a stable set of recognizable motifs and images. To a degree, the point of a sampler was to be generic or rather to be legible this was not just a form of personal expression, but a calculated investment. And it was important that people be able to understand what a sampler demonstrated about a young girl's education. Repetition, as uh, Emily was talking about in the opening remarks, um, was part of its value. So once meant to be rolled up and stored, now the sampler was often framed and displayed in a place of pride in the house. The sampler no longer simply anticipated and prepared for a specific material future, a future in which a woman would have embroidery to perform, but also functioned as a tool to help bring this future into being. The sampler was understood to be a sensible investment in a particular kind of girl's future, one performing and ensuring her status. Displayed samplers, evidence of work and material investment might advertise a girl's training and refined femininity, as well as her family's resources, thus showing her to be an advantageous marriage match and thus perhaps bringing about the future that the samplers anticipate. So the choice of subject here mattered. People also questioned during this moment, this late 18th and early 19th century moment I'm talking about, people also questioned the value of a needlework education for young women. Would it bring about an abundant and prosperous future? Did it prepare her for her future life? Did it hinder the full flourishing of a young woman's mind? In the late 18th century, young girls attending ladies seminaries or academies might be trained in the feminine accomplishments, dancing, painting, music, needlework, et cetera. But critics argued that these fields encouraged frivolity or indolence, that young women were not being trained to be suitable citizens of the young nation or truly mothers to citizens. By the early 19th century, well-off girls were starting to move into some more formal educational settings and might be exposed to coursework in mathematics, chemistry, astronomy, and more. The early 19th century was a time of flux, argument, and anxiety in girls' education. Advocates continued to champion decorative needleworks applications to more practical needlework skills, its pedagogical heft and the ineffable air of refinement that it imparted. Its tract detractors, on the other hand, dismissed it as a frivolous waste of time, a relic of antiquated expectations about women's lives. A writer for the New England Galaxy wrote that needlework education was no longer sufficient to prepare women for their futures. This writer argued in 1826 that it was, quote, grievous to see time spent in superfluous stitching, which should be devoted first to the acquirements of sound bodily health and next to the cultivation of the mind. But in an 1838 piece in the Ladies' Garland, an anonymous author railed against contemporary moves away from needlework education at ladies' seminaries asking, quote, is the education of a young lady rightly conduced when the accomplishment of needlework does not form a prominent part? We think not. 
that accomplishment is of great value to every female who prizes nicety. So I wanna read building samplers amidst these concerns as uh, Glenn was saying earlier, as a, as a form that's actively intervening into a debate. Because the house becomes a truly commonplace image in pictorial samplers and needlework pictures in this late 18th, early 20th century moment, just around the time when people are beginning to question whether needlework is the best form of education for young girls when people are arguing about what kinds of futures young women are being prepared for. These were active debates, people disagreed, and I view building samplers as potential entrants into those debates, attempts to assuage multiple parties. Perhaps you're using the geometric and geographic tool of similar figures, but it's in service of composing a needlework project. Perhaps a teacher is instructing young women in architecture but they're applying their lessons to samplers. At the very least, I think that building samplers open up a window into a fascinating educational moment. Female academies might still be offering training in fancy needlework and feminine accomplishments, but perhaps might also be offering training in cartography, geometry, even the study of architecture. So in this context, the building sampler fuses a traditional domestic form that anticipates a woman's interior place within the home with the image of the exterior of a building, a piece of property often set on terrain, a stretch of land. It might display an understanding of architectural and even geometric principles. So in this moment when the question of appropriate education for girls is so live, building sam samplers flourish and become incredibly detailed. And truly it was a ubiquitous form. I can't stress this enough. It was repeated throughout the colonies and eventually the states, Maine to Mississippi, Massachusetts to Alabama. And I read the house form on many of these pieces as functioning similarly to one of the moral verses that a young girl might stitch below her alphabet or above her name. It was meant to be absorbed. It was a form understood to help shape a young woman's mind and her sensibility. In the early 19th century, architectural forms were understood to communicate moral character and had deep national significance. Writers like Andrew Jackson Downing would go on in the 1840s to argue that the facade of the house and its internal composition were key to reflecting and shaping the citizens contained within. And educational reformers in the 1840s would argue about the importance of women's understanding of these, of these forms as guardians of the home. Louisa Tuthill, for example, made an impassioned argument that feminine domestic grace was more than compatible with academic training in the subject of architecture. In 1848, she published the first history of architecture published in the United States, and also wrote that, quote, a knowledge of the rise and progress of architecture ought to be acquired by every well-informed lady, end quote. I think that her work needed the slow, steady linking of virtuous domestic femininity and architectural forms that had been seen in building samplers for decades by the time she was writing to so clearly declare a right relationship between womanhood, morality, and the literal form of a house. Catherine Beecher, another educational reformer, would also argue that it was fundamentally important for women to understand and exercise control over the literal forms of their houses. Her book, a treatise on domestic economy, which was directed at a female readership, was full of architectural plans and she expected women to look at these carefully and take them in. She argued that house forms had moral and material implications and it was women's expertise in them that enabled them to raise good citizens. Building samplers and needlework pictures may have been a place where these ideas percolated without necessarily seeming to disrupt the existing understanding of a young girl's appropriate education and by extension, her future. And the same arguments that I see happening in these building samplers are later taken up by activists agitating for women's property rights. They argue that women were trained in knowledgeable, careful management of the home, that they were educated in virtue and benevolence from a young age, and that they needed to be equipped to defend the home against, typically the argument goes, defend the home against the poor choices of a, of a husband, um, especially the loss of a home from poor investments or debt. So the idea here was that it was precisely women's role within the home that fitted them for moving beyond its interior, protecting it as property 
These ideas relied explicitly upon women's domestic virtue, ideas about their benevolence, their training in self-management and refinement, seeing these as bulwarks against a masculine culture of risk, speculation, and dissolution. The first Married Women's Property Acts began to be passed in the late 1830s and trickled through the states over the next few, few decades, usually using this same logic. Building samplers shored up this discourse, associating feminine knowledge of and control over property with benevolence and tradition. Though I will also note that there's some interesting Quaker schools that banned doing building samplers, seeing them as kind of too bound up in this idea of uh, acquisitiveness and being oriented towards worldly property. But because samplers made space for young girls to dis display American landscapes as feminine terrain, property rendered benevolent, orderly, and smooth in stitched form, the ownership and maintenance of property was considered core to citizenship, but it was also a source of deep anxiety. I see building samplers as a way stitchers work to assuage some of those fears, to represent terrain and the built environment as orderly, manageable, and bountiful through its relationship to domestic femininity. So I'd like to look a little more closely at the needlework picture that I opened with, which is, uh, which is in the Multitudes show. Um, it's a remarkable piece. Um, it was likely stitched in the first decade of the 19th century in Newburyport by a nine-year-old girl, as I mentioned earlier. And it's really stunning in its architectural detail. It depicts a federal style building, three stories high with a widow's walk, um, a term that I have always found fascinating, um, a widow's walk up on the, on the roof there, um, a space from which to survey surrounding lands. And it's eminently ordered. The windows are mullioned, divided into neat squares that evoke the grid that was beginning to be laid over the nation as it was being surveyed divvied up and rendered abstracted property. The widow's walk is anchored by double chimneys, repetitive symmetry, suggesting the balanced character of the house, its steadiness, and by extension, the steady balance of the citizens living within. A path leads from the fence, bordering the abundantly floral yard to a massive door attended by a fan light over the top. The surrounding lands are irregularly dotted with signs of agrarian productivity, a flock of sheep in the foreground, and gentility, a steady stream of neatly dressed visitors coming from the town into the background of the house. But all within the yard and the house itself is ordered, careful, precise. In her stitches, this young girl has rendered the home both a feminine space constructed from silk threads and through feminized labor, labor and a place of order. This may have been an observation of an actual building, but my own study of building samplers has revealed that often these remarkably detailed building samplers were just as likely to be taken from architectural plans or other forms of print culture. These were house types and young girls were partly learning which types communicated morality, order and good citizenship. In 1799, for example, Sarah Holdsworth stitched the facade of the Lancaster Poor House in Pennsylvania but she likely based her work on speculative plans as the building wasn't completed at the time of her sampler making. Plans had been presented locally and Hallsworth or more likely her teacher, Leah Bratton Gallagher, who, um, whose name and family are recorded here on the sampler, interestingly, um, they might've had access to these speculative representations. And Sarah's version of the poorhouse here is, is remarkably accurate, featuring multiple pedimented doorways, four chimneys, and an array of other details. You can see this rendering of what the um, poorhouse would have looked like circa 1800. So I want to emphasize here that building samplers were not just about a young girl's personal observations of her own home or school, frequently designed by a teacher, building samplers reflected a multiple collaborative vision. I love the theme of multitudes, which I think helps us understand samplers and needlework pictures as objects without single authors. They're cultural expressions, of course, but they were also literally designed and executed by multiple actors. An entire family might be involved in the formulation of an appropriate sampler. Kim Ivey's wonderful research has noted that only Windsor, a Rhode Island merchant working in Virginia in the late 18th century, wrote about his struggles finding, quote, 
a draft of a suitable building to put in Nancy's sampler and a letter home to his wife. His daughter was at um, Polly Balch's school and looking for a building to stitch. So these choices really mattered. Hannah Staples' 1791 sampler in the collection, um, likely stitched near Portland, Maine, shows how the emblem of the house might function as a kind of semiotic sign and nest alongside other signals of feminine education, her alphabet, decorative bands of stitching she might later work on linens, and her own name and birth date. The houses repeated here seem nonspecific, a reference to the idea of a home. Everything is gridded neatly within the space of the linen weave of her backing cloth. Trees dot the base of the composition uniformly. Verisimilitude is clearly not the purpose of this depiction. The house is a decorative detail, but also an instructive one. Order and feminine industry are linked here. She worked another sampler in the American Folk Art Collection. This one I love, it features more specific house forms pairing three houses with a verse. Hannah Staples is my name, and with my needle, I wrote the same. And if my skill had been better, I would have mended every letter. This was a really frequently repeated verse in schoolgirl needlework of this era, um, derived initially from um, penmanship, penmanship exercises that um, typically young men would be performing. Though I will note that um, generally those exercises blamed the pen rather than the skill. So the sampler context here, um, if my skill had been better, I would have mended every letter, has a kind of aspirational quality to it. The sampler context emphasizes the need to shape a young woman. The building here we can see as an emblem of her future, a woman shaped by this domestic training and running a household. Women, women's role within the home had long been used as justification for the impropriety of their full political participation, in particular, voting and owning property. But building samplers seemed to challenge the logic of coverture or the assertion stemming from English common law that women should be shrouded within the home, covered by their father or husband, and therefore not able to vote, own property, enter into contracts, et cetera. Coverture argued that this protected women from the taint of the public and the political and allowed them to ex exert their benevolent influence precisely because of their sheltering from civic life. But building samplers envisaged the ways that later reformers would invert this logic, arguing that women's moral stabilizing forces were constrained within the home and that extending property rights and the vote eventually would allow them to wield their moral force on the nation as a whole. That moral force was evidenced through their governing of the domestic sphere. Building samplers appeared as a way to work out bountiful, beautiful, moral visions of buildings and property laboriously created by young girls. We can think about Margaret Moss's 1825 sampler here, which places the building sampler, and this is a, an iteration of it known sometimes as the busy yard, um, on this vision of humming orderly prosperity under the watchful eye of the bald eagle, flags in its talons. So I often think about what it means to try to link feminine authority with property ownership, particularly in landed property. We can tell this story in an empowering fashion, looking at, as I have been, mostly young white girls and celebrating the ways in which they're building samplers help us understand efforts to give young women educational opportunities and to enshrine women's right to property ownership in law. But that's a pretty limited story that fails to contend with the many ways that these narratives, this idea that um, you can bring a domestic feminine imprimatur to property, to, um, to ideas about land ownership and building ownership, these narratives are yoked pretty fundamentally to white supremacist histories. This imagery, I believe, was used to naturalize white settler claims. Just for example, Sarah Jordan's stick sampler, stitched in 1831 in Valley Creek, Alabama, gives us a vantage point on young girls' needlework in the context of violent dispossession of native lands. Worked as the Indian Removal Act was being enacted, her sampler works to show orderly, prosperous buildings, any signs of violence or resistance, 
smoothed out in her neat gridded stitches. Uh, this is potentially a depiction of her own school. So this echoes the language being used in the Alabama Supreme Court that year to argue that indigenous communities did not constitute sovereign nations, arguing that white settler forms of orderly agrarian prosperity evidenced true ownership over the land. Over 14,000 Creek people were forced to move to lands west of the Mississippi shortly following. Similarly, E.J.'s needlework picture stitched in 1811 in Natchez, Mississippi, shows the plantation landscape potentially with slave quarters here as a place of feminine order, lushly populated with flowers and a languorous feminine figure. The specific landscape in 1811 was also the site of an uprising of enslaved people seeking to liberate themselves and murder murderous retaliation by the state. The emblem of the plantation household was freighted with meaning in this time and this place. Aligning it with this image of benevolent white womanhood worked to naturalize and smooth over the reality of the violence inherent in this project of transforming land and people into property. And I'll note also that the first Married Women Property Acts in the United States were intended to perform slaveholders property, uh, to protect slaveholders property from debt collectors um, and things like that. What I want to say here is that it matters who stitches these works and in what contexts. Building samplers work to align moral and aesthetic femininity with the exterior of the built environment, linking domesticity with property, with terrain, with architectural forms, and this can be put to many uses. I'd like to close with one final example, Sarah Harris's building sampler, and this is at um, Winterthur. Sarah Harris was a free black woman living in Connecticut and she stitched this sampler likely as a young teenager prior to seeking admission in Prudence Crandall's all white school for young ladies. Once she entered, white parents pulled their daughters from the school and Crandall closed it for a time before reopening it exclusively for young women of color. The town organized against them and threatened Crandall and her students with violence and legal action. This story came to be at the center of the Connecticut Black Law, which prohibited the teaching of Black students from across state lines, state lines. Part of the vitriol directed at Sarah may have had to do with her mother, Sarah um, Sally Harris, and her property ownership in the town. She purchased 64 acres of land and a house for herself. Before this was technically legal in 1832, exactly the year when Sarah started at Crandall's school. The property abutted prominent local figures who actively lobbied against Sarah's admission into the school, but they were likely not responding just to the education of Black girls, but the property ownership of Black families and Black women in particular. It's important to understand what the emblem of the house might have meant to Stitchers, what these visions of feminine management and control conjured. I read this sampler as one tool that Sarah used to claim her right to the signals of cultivated femininity and to direct her own future which in fact included property holding. She married and became Sarah Fairweather and moved to Rhode Island, a state that granted married women's property laws in 1848. And in 1853, Sarah bought a piece of land and a house near her husband's family's blacksmith shop. In her will, Sarah left her house, which had become a site of her own abolitionist organizing to her daughters, Sarah and Mary, rather than to her sons. These stories shimmer around the emblem of the house that she stitched as a young girl in the, that anticipatory form of the sampler, a form that was made to help bring about a future. These kinds of works are often considered merely decorative, charming, or naive, my favorite, examples of girlhood industry. But samplers were and are important cultural works, and the ubiquity of the icon of the house helps demonstrate its deep embeddedness in cultural messaging. Its meaning is not singular. It shifts depending on the context of the young woman stitching, but it gives us a window into the lives and stories of hosts of young women who embroidered themselves into the historical record. It offers us a glimpse into the multitudes. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maria, for this uh, really detailed and uh, profound um, look at, um, at the school, um, school girl works and uh, samplers. Um, uh, we, have, we have some questions, but I, I'm going to start off uh, 
with a few questions, um, looking also again at, uh, at your really unique approach to these samplers and how they, they bring to the surfaces um, stories and, uh, and experience that are hidden in the back and, uh, and struggles uh, for, for white, but also as you do like connection also with uh, white supremacy and the disposition of land. So I was, yeah, I, was, I, will, I would love maybe for you to talk a little bit more about how you construct this idea of this object as anti separatory form. And so by building maybe materials outside the object itself. Yeah. Um, the idea of this anticipatory form is I think really interesting to think about um, overlaid with the context of um, speculation and land. Mm -hmm. um, and there's this way that a sampler is considered a safe investment um while sort of masculine ideas about speculation are, are really objects of concern um, in the sort of early 19th century moment um, but i think of samplers as anticipatory um, first because their kind of original form is is this reference document right so they're they're a place where a young girl is practicing something and, and of course the fact that you're that you're practicing means that you hope that you'll be able to be actually deploying this skill in the future, right? Um, so they start as these reference documents and the form evolves as I was talking, you know, that they become these much more pictorial um, display objects, um, often with moral verses and um, kind of carefully chosen scenes. But I really think that that ori original meaning of a reference document is kind of dragged into <laughs> Um, the, the later evolution of the form, that there's this idea that what you're doing here is creating a woman, um, that you're, you're creating a future for a young girl. And I mean, it makes, it makes sense that um, families would have thought about this. I mean, as I said, this was really expensive uh, training. And so you mm -hmm. probably only do it if you imagine that you would have a real material benefit in the future. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, but I think this idea of sort of pulling this original form um, of preparing for a future um, really informs the kind of later um, evolution of the sampler in the 19th century. Yeah. And, and you give them such a political significance, you know, as, as, uh, as they enact something and also a political thing. Um, as, I thought that was very interesting also, um, the way you talk about this works as uh, dismissed as naive, but there's a twist in your approach that I, I found very, very fascinating and, and striking is that this idea that, yeah, they look naive, but it's so much more complex than you think. And that's, I, I would love for you to talk about this twist and because it's, um, it's, yeah, I think it's very powerful. Yeah, th thank you. Um, I, I find them to be very powerful objects. I mean, they're so communicative about a culture's values at a kind of given moment in time. Um, but I know that many needlework te teachers were also thinking about, I mean, many of these teachers were um, women who were making alternative life paths for themselves. Um, perhaps they were teaching in their own home, perhaps they were soliciting money to start a school. Um, so it's kind of interesting to think about the interaction between these women who in fact were not leading traditional lives as being the teachers um, generally for, um, for these young women. Um, but the, the idea that they're naive um, really fascinates me. And I think people often turn to the sort of like, um, the clearly not realistic um, depictions, you know, the like massive shepherd who's sitting underneath like a tiny little willow tree. Um, and what I think there is that um, the realistic depiction clearly doesn't matter. That's not the point of what is going on because these are incredibly skillful depictions. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so if people wanted to depict things realistically, they would. Um, there's something else going on. Um, and what I see is that these are functioning as kind of semiotic signs. Um, they're pointing that a woman, that a young girl understands that these references have meaning, um, that a shepherd means something to, you know, the 1790s cultural milieu in Boston, right? That, um, that the image of Adam and Eve signifies something. She's placing herself in kind of a, a larger system of signs. Um, and that that's really the, 
the purpose of what's going on there, not a kind of like verisimilitude of, of life. Sometimes that's what's going on. And you can see that happening really skillfully in many needlework pictures, um, you know, reproduction of life. Um, but that's not always the, the purpose of the piece. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like the, the way you think about them as, as sub, submersive, subversive forms as well. I think this is really interesting. Um, there are some questions uh, specifically about the samplers, and I would like to share them with you. So someone is asking what the average size of a sampler, and another person is asking if, uh, if are, are most buildings bilaterally symmetrical? So if you can answer those questions about the, the material itself. Yeah, these are great questions. So sampler sizes range dramatically. Um, and there's a little bit more, um, well, they're often constrained by the width of a piece of linen backing cloth, typically. Um, and there's a little bit more standardization when they become pictorial and they're framed. Um, but they can be anything from, you know, like wash rag size where you get, you know, a girl's alphabet and her name, maybe, um, to pieces that are, you um, several feet across and several feet high. Um, I was looking recently at a building sampler by Anne Plato, who was the first woman of color to pu publish a book of poetry um, in the United States in the early 19th century. And her needlework picture, when you're looking at it, it's almost like you're looking through a window. It's so large, like it, um, it gives you a sense of um, a scene really that you're like looking out onto. So there's really wide variability with, um, I think, kind of the majority being, you know, like standard frame size, right? <laughs> um, and the symmetrical question, um, a lot of the buildings that I look at are symmetrical. Um, that, that has to do with the kind of um, aesthetic preferences of the time period um, and this idea of balance and symmetry being really important. But I have also seen other examples um, that maybe depict a symmetrical house, but it's a three quarter view. So the, the sampler itself is not, a, it's not a symmetrical form um, or depicting a, a much more kind of um, haphazard building. There's some kind of delightful examples um, of those. So it, it ranges widely, but mostly, um, mostly symmetrical. We have much many more questions, um, but um... As uh, Liz, uh, Liz Warren, uh, president, is asking, do you mean that the samplers help establish the girl's right to the property depicted? So to go back to our question before, and mm -hmm. someone is also commenting on that idea, where, uh, where is this marriage property ownership law widely adopted, or is so when and in what states where are those laws binding cool women context ownership? So it's a lot of about uh, women's rights history and... Yeah, this is really complicated. Um, yeah, yes, for <laughs> this very deep question. Yeah, I'll I'll say very very briefly um, mm -hmm. that I there's great writing and I'm gonna um, I'll put it in the chat later the name of the scholar I'm thinking of but um, she writes about the fact that clothing and textiles were often the first forms of property who are other um, the people who are otherwise not allowed access to property could claim so women. Um, enslaved people, people who are not considered citizens might be able to claim and often did claim in courts of law ownership of their textiles um, because they made them. <laughs> um, and so that's an interesting, I think, kind of layer to thinking about the sampler. Um, and women's property laws are very complicated but evolved over the course of the 1830s through the rest of the 19th century. Um, and as I mentioned with um, Sarah Harris's mother, sometimes women in fact, did own property when it wasn't legal for them to, because it was idiosyncratic and um, it just seemed to work in the in the context that they were in. So it's a it's a messy and fascinating story um, that I'm that I'm working on writing on. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Someone is also asking if you haven't published anything yet on this uh, issue and where. So if you can maybe put that in the chat uh, later on, that would be amazing. Sure, I'll share my dissertation um, in the chat, but I'm I'm working yeah. on a, on an article, um, which I will which I'll absolutely share. No, oh, thank you so much. Exciting. Um, so we're going to move to our uh, second um, presenter, um, Trevor Brand, um, and we we're going to continue also thinking about decorative objects and how they operate in wider space than just a household. Um, so Trevor's talk is. Uh, 
more than memory, new perspectives on the closed top fracture collection. Uh, Dr. Trevor Brand is a student and a nearby family distinguished doctor fellow in art history at the University of Chicago, where he focuses on early modern and German American print and devotional culture. His recently published chapter in an edited volume examines the genre of an interactive pr uh, printed prayer objects among German Americans. He received his bachelor's degree from the Pennsylvania State University and his master's from the Winton Tour Museum in Delaware. Prior to joining the University of Chicago, he was the curator of the American Sandwich Historical Museum in Philadelphia, where he organized several shows on Scandinavian art and design. It's my pleasure to turn it to you, Trevor. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for the introduction, Mathilde. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you, Mariah, for the fantastic presentation and a series of images. Um, let me just share my screen here. Um, I'm thrilled to <clears throat> join the other presenters in offering new discoveries uh, on folk art in celebration of Multitudes and the American Folk Art Museum's 60th anniversary. Before starting, I would like to quickly thank my fellow presenters, also Elizabeth and Erwin Warren and the FM staff for facilitating this. And finally, Suzanne Carr-Smith, curator of Chicago's Newberry Library. My talk today offers new insights into a major collection of Frachter, which is the typically Pennsylvania German illuminated folk art that flourished in the mid-Atlantic region in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, here on the upper left, we have uh, an example which is displayed in the Multitudes exhibition uh, created by um, an unknown artist for a young Schwenkfelder girl in Pennsylvania. And the bottom right is an object that we'll uh, examine a little bit later on. Specifically, um, I will look at three selections of printed and illuminated Fraktur in the Stop collection at the Newberry Library, which is a valuable research institution in Chicago. In considering these objects, I expand on traditional conceptions of Fraktur as being primarily a passive recipient for family memories. Rather, I consider how this folk art maintained connections with wider regions and objects. First, I examine works possessing national and international connections. I then explore the active role of these objects as spiritual protectors of the household. And finally, uh, the interactions between Frachter and other memory keeping objects within the German American home. In all, I hope to convince you that these objects maintained complex multifaceted lives and cannot be framed as inhabiting only a single conceptual space. By way of introduction, the Stop Collection is a repository of around 1,350 printed and manuscript Fraktur, ranging from around 1,700 through 1,900. The collection was assembled by Fraktur's foremost expert, Dr. Klaus Stopp of Mainz, Germany, who used these objects to publish a massive six volume compendium of one specific genre of Fraktur, that of the birth and baptismal certificates, which again we see on the screen here. Such certificates preserved for Pennsylvania's German speaking population important information about the earliest lives of their children. Unlike other genres, these certificates had little precedent in Europe. Rather, they developed in Pennsylvania in the mid 1700s to preserve family memories in a land where both churches and families were scattered, necessitating novel forms of record keeping. They're also Frachter's most numerous genre, created by among the most renowned itinerant artists. As such, part of the goals of this talk are also in introducing you to the most important Frachter artists as represented in this collection. Though Fraktur was a distinct regional style, it was not isolated or devoid of interaction beyond German settlement. This birth and baptismal certificate for Elizabeth Waldborn, born in 1789 north of Lancaster and baptized in 1802, is an example of a Fraktur artist drawing upon an international German visual culture in creating these objects. The artist Friedrich Krebs was a Hessian soldier during the revolution 
later becoming a schoolmaster and artist, active in several counties of rural Pennsylvania. Krebs is responsible for a massive body of Fraktur today, dating from around the 1790s through the early 1800s, being recognized today as the single most prolific Fraktur artist. He worked closely with commissioned printers in Reading to design the printed portions of his wares, which he then often embellished with his own carved woodcut stamps and pasted images. This is exactly what we see in Elizabeth Valborn's certificate. Over 20 cut and pasted decorative gilt papers that lend to the object a three-dimensional sculptural quality. Zooming in, these images show figures engaged in uh, several manual and artistic trades, uh, such as, for example, we see printers down at the bottom right, cabinet makers, uh, carpenters, and appropriately, scribes and artists. Um, among many others. And we, we can see just very minutely some of the gilding which has survived on this particular uh, piece up here. But for the rest, unfortunately, a lot of the gilding has uh, since worn away. Also in the four corners of the object, we encounter images of Old Testament saints from a different design source, which uh, really balances the prosaic nature of the trades with a much more overtly religious quality. Friedrich Krebs cut these 20 images from imported sheets of German brocade paper, likely ordered through agents in Philadelphia and connecting his art with both regional and international trade networks. Such papers mimicked embossed leathers or fine wallpapers. Uh, for example, here's a, uh, a more floral example, which we see from the period. Uh, and these objects were predominantly printed in Augsburg where the art was invented in the 1600s. By the late 1700s though, over 50 such decorative print shops were active throughout Europe. As Krebs's pasted scenes are both derivative of and inferior to identical ones by renowned Augsburg-based printer, Johann Karl Munch, it seems likely that his imported papers were of a less expensive pirated edition printed elsewhere in Germany, perhaps another important print center such as Nuremberg. Um, and we can connect a couple of the images uh, between these two sources. So for example, looking at the carpenters here, we can see uh, a virtually identical scene uh, down in the bottom left here. And our friendly bakers we see uh, up here in the upper section. Um, so almost identical, but not quite as good. Numerous other certificates by Friedrich Krebs within the Stop collection have similar pasted brocade papers in a blend of different colors and styles. We see, for example, more saints backed onto a yellow painted paper with uh, flowers and urns, which are cut to match Krebs's uh, watercolor decorations uh, precisely. We even see, and uh, this is my favorite, uh, a blend of different domesticated and wild birds, uh, including a wild turkey and uh, an eagle pasted onto this unused uh, and unsold uh, birth and baptismal certificate, uh, perhaps suggesting that German printers were aware of their new world audience. Um, but perhaps it wasn't so popular if this example in particular didn't sell. The diversity of these imported papers within Krebs's works and the presence of, quote, stamped and pictured, end quote, papers in the artist's estate inventory suggests that this international German visual culture would continue to influence Friedrich Krebs's local style until the artist's death in 1815. If the Waldborn certificate connects with regional and international spaces, the next complicates our understanding of how birth and baptismal fracture operated within the household. This certificate, printed in 1813 by Ambrose Henkel of Virginia's Shenandoah Valley, turns what is often seen as a passive vessel for memory into an active spiritual defender of the family. Henkel does this by blending two genres in one object, printing standard birth and baptismal text on the bottom with a spiritual house blessing above within an abstracted depiction of uh, a steepled house. <clears throat> 
These house blessings were displayed within the German American home and essentially sought divine protection against physical harm, uh, physical harm, familial strife, and uh, especially agricultural disaster. So, such objects are similar to objects on display in multitudes, uh, such as the spiritual clockwork, in possessing a uh, really quite strong European antecedent, um, essentially adapting to conditions in the New World from a much older Catholic devotional tradition, um, in this case, having devotional hours that you spend um, in meditations or in prayers. The certificate's unusual nature is underlined by its being accompanied in the stock collection by Ambrose Henkel's printer's proof of the exact same object. Signed by Henkel himself in the bottom, uh, bottom left, uh, this object, this prototype, plots out the sheet's blessing, certificates, and decorations all on one sheet. The proof's manuscript text in German script matches the final printed version exactly, suggesting that its commissioner, the itinerant, art, the itinerant artist Peter Bernhardt, was uh, highly satisfied with Henkel's model. Due to their relative isolation from other areas of German settlement, uh, the Henkel Press was really quite renowned for its entrepreneurial, even experimental printmaking out of the Shenandoah Valley. To that point, I have not located any, any other example of a printed house blessing combined with another genre of fructor. Yet for such a complicated object, we must also ask, how did it actually function within the home? Its status as a record keeper, in this case for Conrad Holweg, born 73 years earlier in 1740, suggests that it might have been folded and stored within a Bible or chest, as was fairly common for such certificates. Yet, as an object of spiritual protection, it was also intended for display near the home's entrance as a sign of the family's Christian values and protection. Examining the object more closely reveals that it was indeed an object of display. Zooming in reveals faint evidence of a painted wooden frame that once outlined the, uh, the rest of the sheet. Um, so it's a bit difficult to see, but I've used these arrows to hopefully point it out. But essentially, it doesn't, cut, doesn't quite cut off the inscribed text at the bottom, which preserves the uh, date and the name of the baptizer. But uh, unfortunately, up here, it's cut off the head of the unfortunate Carolina parakeet. Um, so the frame wasn't quite large enough to uh, frame the, entire, uh, the entirety of uh, Bernhardt's illuminations. The fact that this outline maintains a faint greenish or bluish hinge, uh, tinge might suggest that the lost panel, uh, the lost uh, frame rather, was a softwood painted in Prussian blue or perhaps chrome green, which was a popular and inexpensive treatment among remote German settlers, uh, as was the case for the painted desk on the screen here which was not painted uh, very long after the fructor. Incidentally, uh, this chest comes from the same area as the series of fructor that we will examine next. The last group of objects that we will look at are the birth and baptismal certificates of three brothers born in the 1780s that highlight the relationships between fructor and other memory keeping objects within the household. Johann Heinrich Latsche, Hans Friedrich Latsche, and Adam Daniel Latsche, uh, very German names, were born in 1785, 88, and 89, respectively, in Mahanoy, Pennsylvania, uh, which was essentially um, about as far on the outskirts of Euro-American settlement in eastern Pennsylvania as you could get. The boys' parents, Johann and Maria Catherine, were among the first settlers in this region, and the objects on this screen subtly attest to the isolation of the family's homestead. Notice, for example, that three different clergymen, uh, Michael Enderlein up here, Matthias Gansel, and uh, Pastor Hans, baptized the three different children, which indicates only the sporadic availability of traveling preachers and missionaries rather than a stable local church or clergy for baptisms. If pastors were rare, then so were itinerant artists who could create Fractor. It would not be until the end of the 1780s that the schoolmaster and artist Henrich Otto would settle in this area, 
creating for the Latcha family a series of beautifully illuminated records of the brothers' early lives. Henrich Otto is perhaps the most celebrated Frachter artist of all time creating a large body of intricate, highly recognizable manuscript and printed objects that mark the high point of the folk art form in Pennsylvania. Born in 1733 in the Rhineland, Otto emigrated to America in 1753 and worked as a weaver before taking up arms against the British during the revolution. Otto's background in weaving would inform his work as a Frachter artist as the indigo resist printing blocks that he carved for printing textiles would later serve as decorative stamps for his Frachter. Um, and this uh, sort of decorative stamped motif that we see in the upper center uh, of this piece of Frachter is this famous uh, textile dye pattern that um, you see in a lot of Otto's works. Otto moved to Mahanoy, Pennsylvania in the late 1780s, and apparently he developed a very close relationship with the Latshaw family as in addition to the Newberry's Fractor, he also painted a book plate in 1799 for a New Testament owned by the family's father and uh, held at Winterthur today. As the designs for each of these printed Fractor seen on the screen post-date the inscribed birth and baptismal details by several years, Otto's calligraphy thus occurred some time after the years recorded on the objects. In other words, they weren't created contemporaneously with each birth and baptism. As such, Henrich Otto needed to base the certificates on another form of record keeping entirely. Such questions about the Latshaw family record keeping led to an exciting discovery in preparation for this talk. In searching for information about the family, I found an online version of the Latshaw family registry posted to a GeoCities website in 1995 that has somehow survived on the internet until today. Fortunately, I connected with the transcriber, a descendant of the family named Louise Lashaw. Louise transcribed the information from her family's 1762 Swiss Reformed prayer book printed in Basel and seen on the screen here. Louise told me the history of the family, its family uh, prayer book and the registry which contains records of Latshaw marriages, births, and deaths from 1782 through 1882, a full century. The prayer book was kept on the original Latshaw family homestead until 1941, when it was inherited by her mother and later by Louise. Of course, this family memory record keeping system existed in tandem with the Latshaw Fractor, Lacking a local church or a stable Frachter artist, such as a schoolmaster, rural German families maintained their own record keeping systems that later dovetailed with the recording of such information on birth and baptismal Frachter. This system ensured the accurate transfer of information from a family Bible or prayer book to its illuminated Frachter. Such information was highly detailed, including the date, day, hour, and very often the zodiac sign of birth. Um, for example, here we have the sign of the Wasserman, uh, which translates to the water man, and I can only imagine must mean uh, the sign of Aquarius. The system was, however, imperfect, as curiously, two of the birth years for the Latchall children are off by a full year. That all other information is consistent between the record keepers suggests perhaps a deliberate alteration the reasons for this change are unknown. Additionally, it is also quite possible, though impossible to prove, to prove that the three Latshaw certificates were actually stored within the family's prayer book. While this diminutive prayer book only measures about five by seven inches, the certificates are folded an unusually high number of times, turning each into a two by three, two by two, and three by four inch object and highlighting the both conceptually and physically close nature of these different record keeping systems within the German American household. The Latshaw certificates will conclude my talk, but I also think that this is an important point at which we all can reflect on the role of scholars in preserving family memories today. The Fractor that we've looked at this afternoon 
once existed within a nexus of family memory objects, household devotional use, and wider connections throughout their long lives in the German-American uh, domestic sphere. Yet these physically and mnemonically fragile objects were often decontextualized, removed by museum and private collecting practices in the 20th century from their places of use, origin, and memory. We can consider that one important role of the folk art scholar today is in helping to reunite these objects with the family memories that once surrounded them. In doing so, we can connect lesser known individuals and artists of the past with their living descendants today. Uh, thank you. And I'm uh, very much looking forward to any questions or comments. Thank you so much, Trevor, for us uh, dive, um, dive into the fracture collection and uh, very close, uh, close look at, at this uh, beautiful uh, object. And, um, and so we, we have some question uh, from our president, Liz Warren. She's asking you if the new Berry collection is open to the public. Mm. That's, yeah, it's a fantastic question. It, it's actually my favorite part about the Newberry Library is how easily accessible it is for both uh, researchers such as myself, but also just the general public. Um, I'd have to double check myself, but I'm pretty sure their only requirement for coming to the library to do research is that you be over 13 years old um, <laughs> and have some sort of uh, an ID. So you can um, basically show up uh, a teenager or a researcher and request to see uh, any number of special collections materials and they'll bring it out to you. And it's a really very publicly friendly way of uh, running a public research institution, which I am a big fan of. Oh, that's wonderful. And it goes also to your, to your approach of the object when you invite um, uh, us to look at the object in, in person. And so I, maybe I would like you to, to talk about this uh, really detailed look and how it informs your practice in general. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I think, I mean, of course, and any scholar will tell you that it's it's best to see an object in person, and it it is. And I, I think that the reason that I was drawn to the Stop collection is because Klaus Stop made this fantastic, you know, compendium of six, and I think it's actually seven now volumes that look at the history of this genre of fracture, um, you know, throughout the past uh, two hundred years. But the, the compendium is so good that I think it's actually drawn people away from visiting the objects. Um, and of, of course, the fact that they're in Chicago and nowhere near um, you know, um, Eastern Pennsylvania is another reason that um, folks don't tend to visit the collection. But of course, that this, this firsthand looking at the object leads to so many insights. Like for example, the, um, the pasted certificate that I was examining, um, it was by no means clear to me from online um, or you know, even images within Stop's collection um, that these were pasted images and not just stamped or even really like hand inscribed. So actually getting to physically visit the collection um, to turn it over to find any inscriptions on the um, on the reverse. Um, this, you know, hands on research is absolutely essential. Um, I, I think you do tend to lose that sometimes in Proctor studies because being a two dimensional art, you know, it's, it's often thought that you, you know, the vision is all that matters, but these are very complex fully three-dimensional objects that um, really require that hands-on um, method of research. Yeah, and you talk really actually reflected uh, on that and we understand now this, their function, the active function in, in the household and that was wonderful also to, to see that and thank you for this. Um, someone is asking actually if the fracture collection is available online, maybe you don't want to tell them. No, I'm yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. I will, uh, I will find it, it's in, my, it's in my email somewhere, the link to it um, and I, I can post it, but it's, it is a fantastic resource. Um, I've I've sort of privileged some of the most visually appealing items of the collection, but there's, um, like I said, about 1,350 other stunningly beautiful examples in the collection. So I'll I'll post it in the chat uh, shortly after my talk. So if you cannot go um, there in person, you still have um, insight uh, online. So uh, Liz Warren is also asking us if do any or all of the auto fracture from the large cash show where or they were printed and by whom. By women? Um, oh, by, by, by who was, yeah, who printed them, sorry. Oh, who printed them? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, it's, 
the, the it's a really interesting commercial relationship in a sense because from around 1740 through 17 circa 1780 um they weren't printed at all um i mean fracture was really only a manuscript tradition until that point and then it's in the 1780s that you do start to get these uh these printed fracture um, the, the famous Ephrata Cloister uh, religious community of uh, Ephrata near Lancaster, Pennsylvania was the first um, truly important uh, print uh, sort of manufactory of these objects. And um, almost all of the genres of Fractor that you look at can, you know, sort of be traced back to influences from the Ephrata uh, print shops. Um, later on, it was professional printers rather than the um, actual Fractor artists themselves who did the printing. So Reading was a really big print center and essentially the Fractor artists would um, commission the printers to create um, say 1500 or 3000 of these certificates that the Fractor artists would um, then illuminate by hand and um, embellish with stamps or other pasted papers like we were looking at and then um, take them around selling them. So it's sort of the illumination and the embellishment all um, predated the infill and the information uh, when they were sold. Someone is also asking, uh, was a pre-written fracture which was filled in later less or less most desirable, uh, less or more desirable to the family? The pre-printed fracture? Yes, it's like pre-written. So before it was decorated, if it's something that was um, filled in later or less more desirable. So basically if, if someone was acquired a mm -hmm. fracture that was not decorated. Yeah, as, as far as I can tell you, yeah, you, you wouldn't really have acquired Fractor that wasn't decorated. So you, you would have bought it from the artist who would then themselves have inscribed it for the family. So um, some of the, the uninscribed ones we were looking at, like the example with the turkey and the eagle, um, that can be assumed as having been a piece that uh, Friedrich Krebs didn't sell. Um, and then it would have um, ended up in some other collections before ending up where it is today. Um, so no, as, as far as I can tell, examples owned by families would have been inscribed with the birth and baptismal information, um, though I very well could be, you know, there, there could be examples that I've, I've missed that uh, that's not the case. I think we um, are going to end up here. Thank you so much, uh, Trevor, for your talk. I, if there is any other questions, um, we will turn uh, the mic to, to our final, uh, final speaker. Thank you so much, Trevor. And, um, so our um, next uh, presenter is um, Yinchi Lermantan, whose talk focuses on the work of one artist, Sheldon Peck, and the title of this talk is Sheldon Peck, Radical Folk Artist. Let me say a few words about uh, Dr. Yinchi Lermantan, who is a Bradford and Christine Mischler Associate Curator of American Art at the Huntington. She received her PhD in art history from Stanford University and BA in American studies from Yale University. Prior to joining the Huntington in 2021, she was a curator at the San Antonio Museum of Art, where she mounted exhibitions of Latin American, American and modern and contemporary art. She has also held positions at the Cantor Art Center at Stanford, the Yale Center for British Art and the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Her work has been supported by the Douglas Foundation, the Andrew Mellon Foundation and the Code Foundation. Please uh, welcome Yinchi. All right. Thank you so much, Mathiel, for that introduction. Thanks so much to the organizers, to the Folk Art Museum, um, to my fellow panelists for the really sensitive and fascinating talks today. And of course, to all of you for sticking around for the last talk. Um, so here we go. Oops. Sort of an unknown man beneath a red curtain hangs in our galleries at the Huntington in San Marino, California. Painted by itinerant folk painter Sheldon Peck, it was likely done between 1827 and 1830 in upstate New York's Onondaga County, where Peck resided at the time. The man's collar and hair are endowed with a strange animacy, and his peachy face has a shadow of a mustache. His piercing blue eyes are slightly askew, adding a signature folk wonkiness to this 19th century portrait. 
The exaggerated palette that, and features of the sitter, like his dark black eyebrows, um, the bright white of his eyes and his collar, and the chiseled quality of his face and body, also give this portrait a graphic and cartoonish quality that distinguishes Peck's signature style. The red curtain behind the sitter adds a feeling of drama, I think, and showmanship to this picture, which is echoed actually in its fascinating afterlife. In 1997, this portrait was rediscovered actually on Antiques Roadshow underneath a 19th century print that had been set into the frame. The curtain somehow echoes the peeling back of the print under which this portrait's bright reds and gleaming whites were preserved immaculately. At the Huntington, this painting hangs in a gallery of American folk portraits from the Jonathan and Karen Fielding collection of American folk art in a room with two other paintings actually also by Sheldon Peck. On the label for this picture, we note that Peck painted portraits while homesteading in Illinois and we also go on to explain that um, a radical abolitionist and active in the Liberty Party, Peck used his home in rural DuPage County outside of Chicago as a stop on the Underground Railroad. The 1975 Whitney Museum exhibition catalog for their exhibition of Peck's work notes that, quote, according to family accounts, Peck was an abolitionist and his house was a stop on the Underground Railroad used by escaping slaves. Looking at this portrait of an unknown white man in upstate New York around 1830, one does not immediately think about the radical and progressive. Rather, the stiff sitter and strange visual qualities might inspire a feeling of remoteness or even inaccessibility, especially for contemporary museum visitors or curators of color like myself. But part of what I want to suggest today is that, in fact, our assumptions um, or visitors' assumptions about a work like this one might not actually be correct. And that, in fact, a seemingly stuffy old portrait of a white male sitter from the 19th century actually can speak to us poetically about the history of enslavement and freedom, multi-ethnic coalitions, and the politics of anti-slavery in antebe antebellum America. With this in mind, this paper responds to two questions. First, what do we know about Peck's radical abolitionism? Um, and secondly, and perhaps more critically, how do Peck's radical politics of equality and also his participation in the Underground Railroad relate to the visual qualities and subject matter of his art? Can we sense this progressive spirit in Peck's strange but captivating portraits of known and unknown sitters? And as a curator in a museum that displays work by Peck, presenting today in this conference of a museum that actually holds nine great Pecks in its collection, um, we might think also about how to unfold this knowledge of Peck's commitment to equality into the act of conserving and displaying Peck's art. The basic facts of Peck's biography give us a sense of how he developed both as a self-taught artist and a radical thinker. Born in Cornwall, Vermont in 1797, his earliest works are pictures actually of his family, a double portrait of his parents um, first and then shortly thereafter in the 1820s, a portrait of his brother and sister-in-law, which you're seeing here on the screen. There's no evidence that Peck received any formal training as a painter. And even in these, some of his earliest known works, he displays that kind of signature style of stiff sculptural figures, cartoonish eyes and features, and an undeniably arresting presence. Peck actually never signed his portraits, but in lieu of a signature, he would often use a marking referred to among art historians now um, as Peck's rabbit track, which you see in an early iteration here on the mantle of his uh, sister-in-law, this lace mantle that she wears. Peck's life as an artist began then as a kind of personal and familial endeavor, um, though he would go on to support himself not only as a farmer, but also painting portraits for commission. In 1828, Peck relocated with his wife to the town of Jordan, New York. Throughout this period in New York, Peck produced a large group of portraits of white sitters, distinguished by the fact that they're painted on wood and not um, wood board and not on canvas. Among them is this double portrait also um, on view at the Huntington uh, in the fielding wing um, of a couple from Ulster County, County New York. Uh, and you see here again um, that signature 
rabbit track marking on the lapel of Samuel Judkin's vest. So how does a white um, self-taught artist like Peck become an abolitionist in the early 19th century? Well, Peck's early career in New York also coincides with decades of increasing abolitionist thought and activity in the state. For instance, a year before the Pecks arrived from Vermont, um, New York abolished slavery throughout the state in 1827. Jordan, the city where they lived, was a kind of a boom town on the Erie Canal, completed in 1825. And others have suggested that this proximity to the canal maybe provided um, uh, uh, sitters for Peck's growing portrait commission business. But in addition to providing portrait clientele in Onondaga County, um, the surrounding region in New York uh, and around the Erie Canal were also home to significant abolitionist activity. As such, there were free black residents in the county, both black and white, um, and both black and white anti-slavery activists. According to census records between 1820 and 1850, the population of African Americans in Onondaga County grew from about 250 to 670, and that was really in the towns of Syracuse and um, Onondaga. A map from the Preservation Association of Central New York study of abolitionism and the Underground Railroad in Syracuse and the county shows a number of known Underground Railroad sites. So that's what you're seeing here on the screen. While these sites might not have been active in the 1820s and 30s when the Pecks lived in this area, they give us a sense of where he may have kind of developed um, an abolitionist ideology. For instance, one site listed here uh, in the town of Onondaga, I think it's um, number 16, um, the, the icon 16 on this map, was the home of Absalon and Magdalena Talbot, a free family of color who owned land. Like other African-American residents of this area, they worked as farmers um, or in skilled trades, uh, Absalom as a blacksmith. And by the 1850s, upstate New York, in part because of its proximity to Canada, would become a major region for the Underground Railroad as well. Um, for instance, uh, and also for abolitionist activity more broadly. Um, for instance, uh, uh, Frederick Douglass ran his newspaper, The North Star, out of Rochester, New York, and Harriet Tubman would retire to Auburn, New York, 13 miles south of Jordan. So in this broader context, it's not hard to imagine that Peck could have had significant contact with this kind of anti-slavery ideology. Most of the evidence of um, Peck's uh, involvement in um, temperance, uh, ad ad advocacy, education advocacy, as well as abolitionism actually comes from his later career spent in Illinois. In 1837, Peck moved his family, including his 12 children to Illinois, first to Chicago, and then to a home in Lombard, which was then known as a settlement called Babcock's Grove. Peck built a wooden clapboard house in 1839, farming the land and actually raising merino sheep, um, and also continuing to travel to paint portraits, even as far as St. Louis. Peck was one of the many, many settlers who moved from New York and New England to the Chicago area in this period. Um, and as in upstate New York, this area was home to radical abolitionist circles, including free black communities um, who formed anti-slavery societies and churches. Much of what we know about Peck's abolitionist politics, um, anti-slavery and underground railroad activity comes from research done by the Sheldon Peck Homestead and Lombard Historical Society, which is housed in the still extant uh, Sheldon Peck home in Illinois. It's recognized as a site on the National Park Service's network of freedom of known Underground Railroad locations. Um, and you see here on the slide, uh, the Sheldon Peck home is identified on the left, um, and then the kind of broader network of sites in the network of freedom um, in a map from the National Park Service on the right. A report published by the Sheldon Peck Homestead in 2018 details some of the evidence of Peck's anti-slavery activity in this period. Peck was a delegate for the Anti-Slavery Liberty Party, and he is mentioned frequently as an agent for the anti-slavery newspaper, The Western Citizen, um, which, uh, yes, which was an, you know, an anti-slavery and um, abolitionist newspaper. 
A documented member of the Illinois State Anti-Slavery Society, Peck hosted temperance and abolitionist meetings in his home. Um, and he also hosted lecturers, uh, including um, various friends and associates in the anti-slavery movement, uh, several of whom he um, uh, depicted in portraits, some of these associates. Um, and most importantly, he was affiliated with um, the Western citizen uh, for which he was an agent and promoter. Um, so during those uh, anti-slavery lectures, he also hosted people including John Jones, um, who was a formerly enslaved entrepreneur and activist whose home was also a stop on the Underground Railroad, and H. Ford Douglas, another formerly enslaved abolitionist and speaker. Um, this information about the Black abolitionists that spoke at Peck's home speaks to the reality that anti-slavery organizing and operations of the Underground Railroad were really dependent on the work of free Black organizers and community organizations. As discussed in um, Cheryl, Cheryl Jennifer LaRoche's book, The Ge Geography of Resistance, Free Black Communities and the Underground Railroad. This reality is actually not often the focus of histories and mythologies of the Underground Railroad, which focus on white abolitionists more often than not. Um, so it bears acknowledging at this point in my talk that Peck's role as a conductor on the Underground Railroad would have absolutely been made possible by free Black organizers, and is just one small part of a larger picture of resistance. Well, Peck's wider politics indicate that he was a robust anti-slavery and under in robust anti-slavery and underground railroad circles in Northern Illinois. Detailed accounts. Um, uh, describe Peck's own participation um, through oral history. And one of the paradoxes of research about the Underground Railroad is that it's a kind of, you know, it was necessarily a clandestine network. Um, so it's often less documented in kind of physical archives. However, the diary of Frank Peck, one of Sheldon Peck's sons, discusses the sheltering of a freedom seeker from Missouri named Old Charlie in the Peck home. And this is a quote from his diary. In the days of the Underground Railroad, our home was a depot and very many were, were the slaves sheltered here while on their way to freedom. Only love ruled our home, chastisement and oppression were unknown, end quote. A portrait of old Charlie attributed actually to Peck's daughter is still preserved at the site. And oral accounts also mention that as many as seven freedom seekers were housed in the Peck home at one time. Okay, so now that I've given you kind of a picture of what we know about Peck's anti-slavery politics, I wanna to return to this second question asked by the presentation, which is namely, um, how do these radical politics of equality and participation in the railroad relate to the visual qualities and what we can see in um, Peck's art? Peck's portraits of known abolitionists are the most obvious tie between his art practice, which seems otherwise apolitical perhaps, and his radical politics. Take for instance, his portrait of James Talcott Gifford and Laura Gifford. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, to a contemporary eye, these portraits don't necessarily connote progressive politics um, as they depict a middle-aged white couple from around 1840. However, as discussed in an exhibition catalog, The Footsteps of His Life from uh, the Sheldon Peck Homestead, um, the sitter James T. Gifford was like Peck an anti-slavery advocate and a member of the Anti-Slavery Liberty Party. The catalog also notes that in this painting of the John J. Wagner family, the abolitionist newspaper, The Western Citizen, which Peck was a promoter and agent of, appears in the painting. Um, in the hand there you see of John Wagner. Wagner was actually an editor of the Western Citizen whose house, according to oral history, was also a shelter on the Underground Railroad. And while not featured in um, that exhibition catalog from the Peck Homestead, a publication from the Yale University Art Gallery about um, this painting in their collection identifies the sitter as uh, John Allsworth, um, who was a printer for the Chicago American newspaper. And he was also a staunch abolitionist. Um, so this shows that, you know, Peck's portraiture actually served some of these um, abolitionist social circles of which he was a part. The portraits of Allsworth and John Wagner also allow us to see that Peck's portrait did not only depict people, but also a kind of progressive print media 
that was key to these anti-slavery circles. As discussed by both Cheryl Jennifer LaRoche and historian Richard Newman, print was the most powerful political tool for early Black activists. LaRoche mentions, for instance, um, Black abolitionist newspapers like the Freedom's Journal, the Colored American, and of course, Douglas's The North Star. Newspapers in Illinois, like the Western Citizen, were not just casual projects. You know, this is really kind of life or death stuff in this moment. For instance, the abolitionist founder of the St. Louis Observer, um, another newspaper, uh, a man named Elijah Lovejoy, was murdered by a pro-slavery mob in Alton, Illinois, um, and became a martyr after that of the abolition abolitionist movement. So, um, and there's, this is just um, a comparison of these two works that gives you a sense of that presence of, of print, print media in both of these works. Um, so comparing the Wagner portrait to an illustration from the Western Citizen, um, which I'm showing you here on the screen, gives us a sense of Peck and Wagner's politics vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Underground Railroad. Here, the metaphor of the Underground Railroad is literalized in a seeming advertisement for the Liberty Line, um, below in an illustration of a train entering a black hole on a mountainside. The 1844 illustration reads, Gentlemen and ladies who wish to improve their health or circumstances by a Northern tour are respectfully invited to give us their patronage. Um, seats free irrespective of color, receipts apply at any of the trap doors or to the conductor of the train. Seeing the peck in terms of this advertisement printed in the paper that Wagner holds, we suddenly kind of understand the radical nature of what, what we're seeing pictured here. Um, but beyond the subject matter in Peck's paintings, is there a way that we can kind of relate uh, the signature self-taught cartoonish style to the reality of um, lived experience, including the, his belief in racial equality? Let me just go back to the slide of the Wagner painting. Scholar of race and hip hop, Jeff Chang, explores the idea in his book, Who We Be, The Colorization of America, that race is sort of a visual problem. Already engaged with the act of seeing and depicting through his chosen medium of portraiture, Peck engaged with the construction of race through vision. In much of 19th century American portraiture, whiteness is constructed really as a site of power um, and as a method of visually consolidating wealth and status. However, I'd like to posit that perhaps the strangeness of Peck's portraiture, like the slight misalignment of eyes that we saw in the first um, portrait, the cartoonish outlines, and, um, you know, some of the kind of wonkiness actually undermines the stability of white supremacy through the destabilization of codified visual language. This may not have been Peck's intention, um, though perhaps these strange visual qualities are in fact, you know, a, a product of Peck's self-trained status, but they are nonetheless, I think, um, acting to destabilize some of those power structures. So especially in group portraits like that of the Wagner family, Peck's white bodies are not celebrated for their kind of perfection, but they're strange or even alien. Peck specialist Nancy Druckmann has referred to the dwarf scale of uh, Peck's hands and feet as a kind of shorthand for legs and feet. The way that limbs seem to surprisingly emerge um, rhymes, I think, with, uh, with accounts, um, surrealist, I think, accounts of freedom seekers like Henry Box Brown, who famously mailed himself to freedom, as in this 1851 illustration, or an account from an abolitionist in Vermont in 1856 who recalled receiving notice of, quote, six parcels coming by train, and before I left the office, the parcels came in each two legs. Take as a counterpoint to the impact of Peck's choices in depicting his white portrait subjects, another portraitist from early America from the British academic tradition, John Singleton Copley. Copley's portrait of Sarah Jackson also hangs in the Huntington's galleries. Um, and Jackson is portrayed wearing a dress of expensive silk imported from England. Like so many of Copley's subjects, Sarah's bodily presence, like her dress, her you know, lace um, mantle, her ruby brooch, are meant to indicate her family's wealth and status in colonial Boston. 
Nika Elder and Diana Seed Greenwald have argued for the recognition of the foundational role of enslavement to Copley's mercantile world. And they've shown actually through really fascinating data analysis that um, 287 of 287 of Copley's portraits that only 12.9% of his sitters did not enslave or trade people or there was insu insufficient information to determine if they did. As Simon Jacondi argues in his book, Close Encounters, Taste and the Taint of Slavery, the realities and violence of enslavement were not a contradiction to the cultivation of gentility by the enslaver, but in fact, the culture of refinement depended on enslavement for its legitimacy. App applied to Copley's portraiture, we might see the rendering of silk and jewelry as a cultivation of taste that is intertwined with brutality against enslaved people. And then thinking of Jacondi's argument in relation to Peck's portraits, so often referred to as plaintive and kind of simple, I wonder if Peck's flatness, simplicity, and unwillingness to fetishize materiality and kind of un you know, seeming uncultivated folk aesthetic might be one visual counterpart to an anti-slavery politics in this period. Is there any connection between Peck's act of painting portraits of his sitters and his activity on the Underground Railroad. Poetically, I can't help but draw a connection between Peck's widely accepted signature, the rabbit track, and the trails and paths of the railroad. Across his pictures, the little path of tracks is decoratively and imaginatively interpolated onto the lace mantles and lapels of his subjects. The encoded nature of this sign of the artist's presence has some kin kinship to the mythology of the Underground Railroad, so much built around the signs that may or may not have literally guided freedom seekers to the clandestine stops along their routes. Contemporary artist Nari Ward engages with what he calls, quote, the Underground Railroad signifiers and mythology in the cutouts and copper nails in several of his works, which reference a Congolese cosmogram. Ward saw this symbol in a church, um, in a church floor, actually, in the first African Baptist church in Savannah that was part of the Underground Railroad, below which freedom seekers would hide. Ward's activation of this kind of symbol is in conversation with Peck's signature sim symbol, I think. Um, iconography of the rabbit, too, which is kind of applied anachronistically by art, hist art historians, but, you know, nonetheless, makes me think of some of the kind of abolitionist implications of the rabbit. Um, for instance, the folkloric uh, hero, Br'er Rabbit, passed down in African-American oral tradition and later published in Joel Chandler Harris's um, volumes of the late 19th century, uh, was a trickster folk figure who outsmarted his oppressors and was like Ward's pictogram derived from African mythology. These connections form, I think, a kind of idea of a folk resistance of both folk art and folk tales. In a recent restoration effort at the Sheldon Peck homestead in the 1990s, the team discovered a um, number of paintings literally in the walls of Peck's home. And on one, there is a mountainous landscape, um, not unlike the kind of rolling hills that we see in the background of the double portrait that we have hanging at the Huntington, which I showed in an earlier slide. In the most literal way, I see this as a kind of conjoining of Peck's artistic practice and the house which literally sheltered um, at least seven freedom seekers, uh, like old Charlie, who was enslaved in Missouri and um, sought freedom, stopping at Peck's house. Here, the painting, um, the act of painting and also the uh, physical space of refuge become one. Art historian Stephen Nelson has also described his act of looking for the Underground Railroad in places like um, Africa, Ohio, searching to see if there's anything that's still in the landscape that we can sort of, um, how we can see that history of the Underground Railroad. As Nelson and others have described, there's a kind of inherent paradox to the history of the Underground Railroad, a mythologizing born out of its unknowability. The contemporary artist Wood Bay has explained that the Underground Railroad has become mythic in part out of necessity as the locations were, um, you know, were not known by, except by the freedom seekers um, and the people who uh, acted as conductors. 
Bay series, Night Coming Tenderly Black, uh, photographed known sites of the Underground Railroad, trying to, quote, look at the contemporary landscape as if it was a landscape of the past. Thinking about one of Bay's photographs from the series and Peck's landscape unearthed from the walls of his home, I think in some way Peck helps us see that unseeable past. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Yin Shi, uh, very much, uh, very much for this generous and insightful uh, meditation on Peck's uh, painting work, and also its significance for the, the history of anti-slavery movement. Um, so again, for everyone in the call, if you have any um, any question, anything you'd like Yin Shi to to um, to clarify for you, please uh, drop us a line in the Q and A feature. Um, uh, I see that we have um, a question. Um, did Peck paint any portraits of people of color as William Matthew Pryor did? Um, as far as I know, uh, I don't think he did. Um, I think there's about 60 portraits that are now attributed to Peck, um, maybe more. Um, some are known, some are unknown sitters, you know, still yet to be identified. Um, so, you know, as far as I know, the answer is no, but, um, you know, it's still possible. I, um, also have a question for you. I, I, I thought that was really, um, interesting also sort of to start, um, thinking about the first presentation and the presentation we have today of, uh, starting new presentation by this idea of drawing a poetic connection, uh, of the work with, um, the current times and today, and I would like you mm. maybe to tell us more about what does that mean to use this language like poetic meditation or speculation in your approach to the object and how you what kind of story you want to tell through them? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I have to say, listening to Glenn's talk, you know, I hope uh, that my kind of thinking about tech is in some ways an application of that type of methodology that he was speaking of and advocating for. Um, and I think, you know, as a museum curator who is thinking about how literally displaying these works, you know, is, um, it can be kind of interpreted or made relevant for visitors, you know, it's an important question. And so that can be done through sort of poetic meditation and just really thinking about like, what does a contemporary museum visitor um, Sort of think when they enter this space and encounter a portrait and you know is it um, depending on that person's subject position you know it could be alienating it could be interesting it could be boring it could be you know thrilling but um, the range of reactions are huge but I think that um, that particular fact we have on our label about Peck's participation in the Underground Railroad really sparked my interest in looking further into this question and you know, not only anachronistically kind of applying our ideas, um, maybe kind of present or contemporary ideas about like, uh, you know, what is interesting or even righteous, but just really thinking about like historically, how did, um, how did this, a work of art like this or this practice of portraiture operate within, you know, historical radical social network and, um, and ideology. So, um, yeah, I think that the poetic's really helpful for something like that too, because with someone like Peck, there's a lot of you know unknowns, and the Sheldon Peck Homestead has done amazing work to kind of uh, tell us more about you know what were his specific connections, who were the people in his circle. Um, but you know, the, something like the Rabbit Track, uh, uh, like signature um, in his pictures, you know, there's something that's just truly mysterious about that, and um, and enticing and so you know that that was an opportunity to me to kind of um, take that poetical turn yes yes you really embraced uh, the mysterious around the work but uh, yeah in a very illuminating way i also really like the way you um, you you talk about your experience in the museum yourself as we were also talking about the importance of being with the objects and looking at them in person and how you draw connection also by just comparing the work with other works in the space, like Chick Stapleton. So I think it's interesting also how you, you, are, you are also looking at the way those objects are exhibited and, and experienced in space. So yeah, if you can talk about this importance of experiencing the work in person. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really something to um, see these works in person. And I think for me in particular, Peck does have this truly like arresting quality that does 
you know, stop you in your tracks <laughs> in a way. Um, there is just something so kind of piercing and, um, and uh, fresh in a way of, too about his style. Yes, and you really, um, you really conveyed it on, on today for ending this uh, really wonderful uh, afternoon of talks and presentations. So, if there is any, I see, I see some, 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 uh, some more questions. So, um, so was uh, someone is asking? I'm pretty sure that Peck's earlier uh, vermin portraits predating the underground underground railroad display rabbit tracks. So, it's more comments. Um, I don't know if you have any. Yes, that's true. Um, so those earlier works, uh, for instance, of his sister-in-law um, and brother from the 1820s do predate, you know, our understanding of his known activity later in Illinois um, in the late 1830s and 40s uh, and, you know, participation then in the Underground Railroad. But um, that, again, is a kind of poetical turn. And I think historically I tried to ground those earlier Vermont portraits and also the earlier um, New York period, just kind of within the broader context of abolitionist activity um, in those um, Northeastern states at that time. And we have one more question before we move to our final, final speaker and uh, our discussion. So someone is asking, did Peg contribute articles or opinions in the Western citizen? Um, as far as I know, you know, he did not contribute directly, but he's mentioned frequently um, based on the research that has been done at the Sheldon Peck Homestead. Um, so, you know, he's mentioned as an agent and also a promoter. So my understanding is that he would have been someone who um, promoted the paper in his local circles uh, and was sort of a, a kind of an ad hoc representative for it. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, what a wonderful way to end this uh, second session. And I wanted to thank all, all our speakers today because it was really an uh, informative uh, um, afternoon. And uh, so uh, now we're going to move to our uh, final speaker, uh, today's discussant, William D. Moore. Um, let me say a few words about uh, our speaker. So. Uh, William D. Moore holds a joint appointment at Boston University between the Department of History of Art and Architecture and the American and New England Studies Program, an interdisciplinary American Studies scholar. He has specialties in material culture, the built environment, and cultural history. He holds a, a BA in folklore and mythology from Harvard, Harvard University, sorry, and Boston University. He researches uh, lectures and publishes on vernacular uh, architecture, folk art, American fraternalism, public history, the interpretation of historic site, and the history of surfacing. Um, I think I also forgot that he has a PhD from the American and New England Studies program at Boston University. Sorry, I'm like putting everything. Um, he's the author of Shaker Fever, American 20th Century Fascination with a Communitarian Sect and Masonic temples, free masonry, ritual architecture, and masculine archetypes. He has contributed numerous articles to exhibition catalogs, books, and scholarly journals. He serves on the editorial board of the journal Winter Tour Portfolio and Buildings and Landscapes. He's currently working on a book uh, on the architecture of Cape Cod and its adjacent islands, which will be published by the University of Virginia Press as part of the Society of Architectural Historians Building of the United States series. So thank you so much, um, William, for being with us. At this point, I invite you to, to join us and close this, uh, this symposium. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to start my remarks by thanking our speakers for their wonderful talks and for their efforts in making the second annual Elizabeth and Erwin Warren Folk Art Symposium such a success. Our speakers have amply demonstrated the current vitality of scholarship in the study of folk art. The title of today's symposium, Objects of Inquiry, was chosen specifically to signal that folk art can play a vital role in investigating history and culture that it has value that transcends the formal, the aesthetic, or the decorative. Folk art deserves to be, should be, an object of inquiry. Moreover, in the second phrase of the title, which calls out new perspectives, as organizers, we meant specifically to highlight the multiplicity of methodologies currently being employed in this broadly constructed field, uh, broadly constructed subfield 
of American culture. In the second decade of the 21st century, folk art studies is a mature field with decades of scholarly literature. Cataloging, identification, and connoisseurship, although remaining valuable and important, are no longer ends in themselves. Whether object-based or object-driven, folk art studies are now in an era of argument and interpretation. In, in my brief closing remarks, I'll take a few moments to revisit our presenters' wonderful talks and offered some comments next to, meant to explicate their methodologies. In this modest analysis, I do not mean to be reductive, to pigeonhole, or to force the talks into categories, but rather I hope to celebrate, to be suggestive, and to bring into focus the diversity of modes of analysis represented by how our panelists have approached their subject matter this afternoon. After addressing each of the presentations individually, I will offer some concluding thoughts about the relationship between objects, subject matter, and methodology. In the first paper, Dr. Adamson's Objects of Dispute, he posited that craft and folk art can create a common ground within American political discourse. He suggested that the peripheral location of these materials can offer a clarifying view through which to look at American culture. In constructing this argument, Adamson falls in the footsteps of noteworthy predecessors, including Holger Hegg Cahill and Leo Marx. This call to recenter folk art, which, uh, which manifest earlier controversies and crisis, or in his call to recenter folk art, which manifest earlier controversies and crisis, he echoes earlier scholars positing that folk art presents a usable past. Um, Political items from the past give us predecessors to the pussy hats of our own time. In thinking about conflict at the center of American culture, he does suggest that there is a unitary American culture and that analysis of particular objects, conflicts, or traditions can help us to understand the national identity. His work could be posited as being derived from the consensus school of historians who mined American history to find therapy for the anxieties of the Cold War, or could be posited as, as flowing out of the myth and symbol school of American studies, which sought to find hidden patterns which wove together a unified national identity. Yannick and Smucker's high style folk art and New Deal values quilts in the index of American design in contrast could be characterized as employing a semiotic approach. Dr. Smucker considers quilts as carriers of meaning and explicates how that meaning is transformed over time. She employs what I like to call double consciousness by bringing into focus both the artworks and those who are presenting or representing them to a new audience. To use the linguistic semiotic jargon, if quilts are signifiers, we can only understand what they signify by contextualizing both those who are using them to communicate and the audience for whom the communication is designed. By placing these quilts within extensive webs of significance, Dr. Smucker shows us that for various actors within the New Deal, including government employees, photographers, artists, and the general public, quilts meant different things. Joseph H. Larnard's Ghosts of a Whimsy's Woodyard, with its attention to class, takes a Marxist approach. Dr. Larnard uses a close reading of objects as texts and speculative consideration of their meetings to understand the life of workers in the Gilded Age. In doing so, he recognizes the distinction between workers and capitalists in that previous age of great income inequality. This presentation uses formal analysis of whimsy bottles and thus the interpretation of folk art to supplement written sources to understand worker identity formation within the context of industrial capitalism. In doing so, beyond the influence of Lincoln and Russo, who he cites, he also continues the earlier work of historians such as Roy Rosenzweig and art historians such as Patricia Hills, who have also been very concerned with the labor uh, or the culture and history of labor. Uh, 
Mariah Gruner's Stitching a Feminine Terrain, Authority, Property, and Home in American Schoolgirl Needlework uses a genre of decorative art that is frequently relegated to antiquarian or genealogical interest to craft a sophisticated feminist argument about property ownership and, and women's rights. She explicitly uses gender as a mode of analysis. For Dr. Gruner, folk art as a means of living the complexities of gender identity formation. She is also attuned to how sanctioned gender appropriate activity was used to edit and reshape gender roles. Trevor Brandt's More Than Memory, New Perspectives on the Klaus Stopp Fracture Collection might be characterized as sociological. He is, in, he is interested in construction of ethnic identity. Rather than focusing solely upon its formal or iconographic qualities, as many previous scholars of Fracture have done, Mr. Brandt uses the form to investigate how cultural identity is reified across both space and time. His presentation also demonstrates that the German ethnic identity was not static, but rather transformed over time in relation to uh, uh, technological change. And in, in conclusion, he also suggested that contemporary folk curators may have a role in mitigating postmodern anime and alienation by helping individuals to reconstruct their ethnic identities by reuniting those individuals with objects created by family members. Finally, Yin Shi Lerman Tan's Sheldon Peck Radical Folk Artist is a noteworthy contribution to our contemporary conversations on race and on the long lasting impact of white supremacy. Dr. Lerman Tan's discussion of Peck can be situated into the expanding literature of whiteness studies, which posits that whiteness itself, along the default identity within American society is socially constructed and that the performance of whiteness has historically been buttressed by the forced labor of people of color. Using John Singleton Copley's carefully staged and constructed portraits as a foil, her presentation suggests that Peck's simple flat portraits represent an alternative abolitionist identity as an alternative to the prevailing American white identity. The abolitionist rejection of, of slave created luxury that um, Dr. Lermontan uh, posits of course resonates with the earlier discussion of uh, the slave-free sugar bowls um, that Adamson presented to us in his talk. And although we have seen a number of resonances among the talks today, I do want to focus on the differences in the approaches between our scholars. So we have seen approaches to folk art that can be described as myth and symbol or nationalist, linguistic, Marxist, feminist, sociological, and concerned with the construction of race and thus of power. Each of our presenters chose an axis of analysis to apply to the objects into the, uh, in their studies and privileged certain modes of inquiry over others. The big question then becomes, does a scholar impose a methodology upon the material they address, or does the methodology somehow emerge organically from the objects being studied? Is there something inherent in the object which tells the scholar what questions should be asked of it? At base, we must remember that folk art studies is a humanistic endeavor. It is not a science, not even a social science. No matter how rigorous or objective we attempt to be, the scholar will always be reflected in their scholarship. The great gift of this, however, is that the same sources subjected to differing methodologies by different scholars can render different equally interesting and valid perspectives. Whimsy bottles subjected to gender analysis or questions about construction of race might provide us with alternative epiphanies. Expanded semiotic analysis of Fraktur similarly could prove fruitful. As Dr. Adamson suggested, alternative or revisionist interpretations of objects should be as fruitful as new readings of literary classics 
or reframing of historical characters and events. Now, I will note that I teach in a university art history department, and I do not to in intend to discount or devalue aesthetics. Yet I also want to offer that in this period in which STEM fields and computer science are in ascendance, and in which everyone readily admits that resources are limited, we might do well when arguing for the importance of museum collections, even art collections, to possibly present them as data sets or as repositories of texts, as storehouses of the human experience. As we have seen today, rather than simply being showcases of pretty objects, these collections allow the creation of object-based scholarship. In the future, these precious repositories subjected to multiple scholarly perspectives will be able to continue to provide novel insights for generations to come. Currently, there's exciting and innovative work being done by scholars who bring an eco-critical outlook to their, to their scholarship or who recognize the agency of non-human animal actors, such as the whales who, who donated their teeth or, or had their teeth taken from them to create the scrimshaw that we saw earlier on. Scholars in the future will doubtless develop modes of analysis of which our current generations have not even dreamed. The continuing accession, management, and maintenance of museum collections of folk art will allow future scholars access to objects of inquiry from which they can continue to form their own new perspectives. Thank you for your time and attention and for the opportunity to share these thoughts with you. Thank you, William, for your attention. You was, you, it was really incredible to hear you start on, on this afternoon. So thank you so much. And also to, to show us uh, not only the multitudes in object, but the multitudes of approaches of, to this object. So that was really, uh, really wonderful. Thank you for, for ending this, uh, this uh, afternoon and symposium in such a wonderful way. Um, so, and also I wanted to, to thank all our speakers today for their generous and insightful perspectives. I think we, uh, we, 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 it inspired us, I hope, to, to go to see this collection in person and see this exhibition that is uh, on view uh, in the museum until uh, September 5th um, uh, during the exhibition of Multitudes. So please come, come see us, please consider coming to, to see uh, the exhibitions on view. Um, I wanted to thank you also everyone uh, on the call for sticking uh, here with us uh, in this uh, beautiful spring day. I don't know if you're in New York, but it's a very, very beautiful sunny day. So thank you for being here. And, uh, and I would like to, to uh, invite you to visit the, the museum website for, for what's coming up next, because there will be other uh, incredible um, programming like this one today. So thank you everyone and take care and see you next time.